Come Holy Spirit, renew the face of the earth. Come Holy Spirit, cast your fire, give us new birth. Come with your power, come with your grace. Come Holy Spirit, renew our lives, we pray. Lord, can there be a greater grace? Lord, you look on us with compassion. We depend on your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, lovely Lord. You are filled with compassion and mercy and grace with your banner of love over me I am longing to see you one day face to face and to be with you endlessly Lord how lovely you are to me lovely
stronger. God, you are higher than any other. I got a sealer, his awesome and power. I got, I got, I got us greater. I got us greater. I got us stronger. God, you are higher than any other. I got a sealer, his awesome and power. I got. Holy Spirit, you are the power of love. Teach me to love. Teach me to pray. Teach me to pray for others. Teach me to be concerned about the needs of others. Teach me to raise up the needs of everyone to you. That I may learn to pray for others, that everyone may be saved in your love for them. Teach me to pray for others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers, when you hear something sad about someone, what do you do? Naturally, we sympathize with that person. When you hear something bad about someone, especially about someone we don't like. Of course, we begin to gossip, spread that bad news with others. One becomes a gossip monger. Now, what's the difference between a gossip monger and an intercessor? Abraham will teach us. Abraham of Old Testament, the father of all believers. Abraham will teach us what's the difference between a gossip monger and an intercessor. It's a beautiful event. In the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 17 onwards. Abraham comes to know something very bad, a bad news, about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. These two cities were very wicked. And God tells Abraham that these two cities would not be able to survive because of the wickedness of the two cities. And when Abraham comes to know the two cities were going to be destroyed, what does Abraham do about that bad news? Abraham begins to intercede with God. Oh God, if 
I managed to find 50 righteous people in these two cities. Would you wipe away those two cities? These 50 innocent people together with the wicked people, would you not save those two cities for the sake of these 50 people? God said, oh, for these 50 people, I will save these two cities. Then Abraham had a doubt whether he would be able to find 50 people. Abraham began to plead with God. Perhaps uh, if I find only 45, God consents. Okay, 45. Abraham was still doubting. And, and Abraham said, God, please, don't be angry with me. Huh? If five people less, Abraham was pleading. And finally, Abraham comes to 10 people. If I find only 10 people, God, please, don't be angry with me. 10 people pleading with God. And God said, Abraham, I'm, I'm very pleased with you. You're my chosen one. And I have chosen you as a blessing for the nations. Therefore, I agree. If you find even 10 people, I will not destroy these two cities. Of course, Abraham could not find even 10 people. But there's something very significant. God listening to the intercession of Abraham. And Abraham, with great love, loving concern, pleading with God. Now, there's something very interesting in this passage. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. God is saying, can I hide anything from Abraham? Can I hide this bad news from Abraham? But friends, when I happen to hear a bad news about someone, I need to know, I need to understand this, that bad news I happen to hear because... God wants me to intercede. Intercede with God that God may save that person. I come to know that bad news not for me to go and spread and destroy that person. No. Destroy the good name of that person. No. Not for me to ruin that person but to save that person intercede for that person. A man, a woman with the Spirit of God will learn to intercede as Abraham was. And in, in the Bible, all the men and women with the Spirit of God has been interceding. Moses, Moses was always interceding with God. Something very significant at one moment, Moses said, Oh God, if you destroy your people, you must now decide your people. I did not conceive them in my womb. Decide your people, you chose them, me, you only sent me to save them. Well, in very, in very tender words, Moses pleading with God. And God would all the time concede. Listen to Moses. Elijah. Elijah pleading with God. First book of Kings chapter 18. For three and a half years, there was no rain, drought in the land of Israel. And Elijah pleaded with God. Elijah understood. Because of the sin of the people. And Elijah 
Elijah led the people to uh, repent as pardon from God. And the people repented in that great sacrifice on Mount Carmel. And there was rain. Rain because of Elijah, the prophet. And the earth produced the fruits. At the same time, Ezekiel, to prophet Ezekiel, God complains, chapter 22, uh, verse 30, this land, this land, in this land, there are priests, there are kings, there are princes, but there's no one, there's no one to plead, to pray for the sins of the people. And therefore, this land is cursed because there's no one to plead with me for the people. That is uh, what God says to prophet Ezekiel. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, in this session, with love, pleading with God, interceding with God for the people. And the early church, after having been anointed with the Holy Spirit, learned that beautiful lesson of praying for others. And the effect of intercessory prayer, book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 onwards, Herod the king and the Jewish leadership were persecuting the Christians. Herod martyred the apostle James. And he understood the Jewish leadership was pleased with that. And Herod wanted to kill even Peter, Simon Peter. And the king imprisoned him. High security prison. And the early Christians were so frightened. And they were praying. The whole church was praying for Simon Peter day and night. And Peter was chained with double chains and so many soldiers. But Peter, Peter was sleeping peacefully. And the church, the whole church was praying. And because of that intercessory prayer, the angel appeared. And, and woke up Peter, brought him out of the jail. And Peter thought he was seeing a vision. And Peter came out. And angel disappeared. And Peter was wondering where he was. And then he knew, ah, God has saved me. He went and knocked at the door of Mary, the mother of John Mark. And that's when the church began to, to rejoice and praise God. The early church knew the power of intercessory prayer. And therefore, St. Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Let me read that for you. First of all, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be offered for everyone, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. This is good and pleasing to God our Savior, who wills everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth for there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and the human race. Christ Jesus himself, human. Now, we need to understand this verse very carefully. St. Paul is writing to his beloved disciple, Timothy. And he's saying, supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings to be offered for everyone, very specially for kings, for all in authority. We must know who were the kings. 
who were the all in authority in those days. The kings were the Caesars. The Caesars persecuting the church, the cruel emperors of Rome, Tiberius, Diocletian, Nero, who were determined to exterminate Christianity. And their henchmen, the governors in the various territories and the tributary kings in the different places. Everybody determined to eliminate Christianity. And then the religious leaders of the Jews, they called Christians the way of the Nazarene. They hated the way of the Nazarene. And they were all the time colluding with the Roman authority to make sure the way of the Nazarene is rooted out from this land. And St. Paul is writing to Timothy, we need to pray for them. For what? Pray for them that they may be saved and come to the knowledge of truth because God wants them to be saved that they may come to the knowledge of truth because it's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. The only way they will be saved is through Jesus Christ. We need to pray for them that they may be saved. And one of the words St. Paul is using are very significant. St. Paul is saying this is the first of all duty of the church. The primary duty of the church. To pray for these enemies of the church. First of all duty. Again St. Paul is saying supplication. Supplication, pleading. You must plead with God. As Abraham. As Abraham was pleading with God. The whole church must plead with God. And my dear friends. What love. What love St. Paul is exercising here. For his enemies. As the word St. Paul wrote. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Conquer evil by good. Do not be conquered by evil. Do not be defeated by evil, but defeat evil by good. That principle, often we feel helpless when a son, a adolescent son, a young daughter goes into an unholy relationship and becomes a rebel or goes into a, a bad habit, an addiction and rebels against the parents. The parents become unhappy, angry, and helpless. My dear sisters and brothers, we are not helpless. We need to apply the principle. Do not be defeated by evil, but defeat evil by good. And what is the good? Intercessory prayer. There's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And that great principle we need to take to heart and there is a great example for that principle and that great example is St. Paul himself. I imagine I am sure about this St. Paul is well aware of that. There is a word St. Paul is writing 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 17. 
First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 if anyone destroys God's temple God will destroy that person for the temple of God which you are is holy if anyone destroys God's temple God will destroy that person for the temple of God which you are is holy well According to that principle, those who do evil to God's servants must be punished. Right? Because um, those who destroy God's temple will be punished. God will destroy them. Now, according to that principle, St. Paul must have been punished. St. Paul must have been destroyed. You know why? Let me explain this to you. Book of Acts chapter 7. Book of Acts chapter 7, verse 58 onwards. We are told of the martyrdom of Stephen. St. Stephen. Um, book of Acts chapter 7, verses 58 onwards. They, the Jews, they threw him, him means Stephen, they threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses laid down their clocks at the feet of a young man called Saul. They were stoning Stephen. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell to his knees and cried out, in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul was consenting to his execution. Ah, this Saul is the one who was later converted and became St. Paul. Saul was an enemy. Of the church dragging Christians, imprisoning them, determined to eliminate Christianity. And this soul was consenting to the martyrdom of Stephen. And that means Saul destroyed the temple of God that Stephen was. And therefore, God should have destroyed Saul. According to the principle, the word that St. Paul later wrote in 1 Corinthians. But what happened? What happened? Stephen had prayed, looking at Saul, consenting to his martyrdom while being stoned. In their excruciating pain, looking at Saul, the young man, Stephen had prayed that not that sin fall upon him, upon them, for the conversion of Saul. The sacrifice of Stephen, the prayer of Stephen was needed. And Saul was converted. Saul became a great missionary, zealous preacher, the first theologian of the church. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, there's a great lesson for us. There could be someone you are crying about. It could be your husband. It could be your wife. It could be someone related to you. It could be someone you love. Living in sin, your enemy, whoever it may be. My brother, my sister, God wants to save him through you. It takes your sacrifice, your prayer. 
as Stephen looking at Saul prayed for him and offered that sacrifice of his life and that brought a great saint a great missionary a great theologian to the church my sacrifice my little sacrifices and my prayer will bring about the conversion of everyone everyone i am praying for i am offering my sacrifices for that is the power of intercessory prayer and in the book of hebrews we read hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 about jesus jesus the perfect intercessor the perfect intercessor jesus is always able to save those who approach god through him since he lives forever to make intercession for them today jesus a high priest is interceding for us on the cross jesus the sacrifice of jesus he offered that sacrifice as a high priest praying for you and for me father forgive them they do not know what they are doing father forgive them they do not know what they are doing praying for every one of us interceding for us offering his life his blood his body that sacrifice for us his prayer and his sacrifice and that saved us he continues to intercede for us the perfect intercessor jesus christ and stephen stephen offered that prayer that sacrifice with the perfect sacrifice of jesus christ and st paul was the first beneficiary of the sacrifice and prayer of stephen and who is going to be the beneficiary of my sacrifices and my prayers could be your son could be your daughter your neighbor your enemy here we stop complaining about someone who hurt us but someone who filed a case against us but someone who gossiped against us who spoiled my good name when someone who spoiled my good name I have a responsibility to save him by offering my sacrifices and my prayers for him together together with the sacrifice perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ I I pray I intercede for him and therefore my brothers and sisters I'm not helpless when my son my daughter my wife my husband or whoever goes astray do not say what can i do oh no i can do many things my jesus has gone ahead of me to offer his life as a sacrifice the lord has said take up your cross and follow me i take up my cross and follow him and become an intercessor intercessor to save him to save her and mother mary mother mary will teach us how to intercede the three characteristics of intercessory prayer as she did at cana john chapter 
at kena there was a problem a real problem that family could have been destroyed according to the custom of the jews of the time wine jars becoming empty the good name of that family could have been at stake but mary saw that she brought that problem to jesus they have no wine it sounds like a statement no it was a prayer a prayer stated in as few words as possible in that in the session three characteristics one the loving concern of mother mary but the mary could not be indifferent to the problem of that family am i indifferent when others are in need it is his problem it is her problem what do i care i better escape from here someone meets with an accident bleeding jesus said look at the ten go and do likewise like what like the good samaritan i cannot go away go and do likewise i must be concerned having concern is my duty i must be concerned loving concern with the need of everyone having concern of mother mary i need to learn from her second absolute confidence when she brings it to jesus they have no wine she has no hesitation no 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 hesitation no doubt and that's why she turns to the family and tells the family do what he tells you to do what he tells you to absolute confidence jesus will do the miracle absolute confidence in the lord trust it is a childlike confidence she does not know what he is going to do there's no compulsion no 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 compulsion trust a difference between trust and compulsion trust absolute confidence a third characteristic is waiting readiness to do god's will no compulsion do what he tells you to do what jesus said in gethsemane not my will that your will be done readiness to do god's will my dear sisters and brothers this is a beautiful parable that jesus said the parable of the unjust judge luke chapter 18 verses 6 to 8 let me read for you uh, how jesus ends that parable you know that unjust judge who would not care for anyone but a poor widow bothers him all the time and finally this unjust judge says oh i will do this because she bothers me all the time and jesus concludes that parable the lord said pay attention to what the dishonest judge says will not god then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night will he be slow to answer them i tell you he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily but when the son of man comes will he find faith on earth will not god then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night call out to him day and night the one thing to do look at the cross the great intercession of our high priest 
offer with that great sacrifices our own little sacrifices and pray with confidence for everyone in need everyone in need with loving concern being sure god will intervene god will answer and that is our duty that is the one thing the first thing the primary thing we must be doing because we are anointed with the holy spirit and then women with the holy spirit of love filling our hearts holy spirit you are the spirit of love teach us to love everyone in need teach us to pray teach us to offer our sacrifices with the sacrifice of Jesus our high priest praying believing god will answer our prayers for those we love Amen. Come Holy Spirit, renew the face of the earth. Come Holy Spirit, cast your fire.